people living in equatorial Africa are living in a hot environment, the skin must have been able to sweat very efficiently so that people could keep cool. And also because that skin was naked and therefore was prone to damage from ultraviolet radiation. And so the skin of our ancestors was dark, full of the natural sunscreen, melanin. Sunlight produces vitamin D, vital for healthy bones. At the time my ancestors first ventured into Europe around 35,000 years ago, their skin was already getting paler in order to absorb more light. Almost certainly the first people to go into Europe were were quite lightly pigmented. This is because Europe with latitudes in the in the 40s to low 50s is well a region of fairly low ultraviolet radiation throughout the year. Populations living in Europe who were not coastal populations had to have fairly depigmented skin in order to allow enough ultraviolet B rays into their skin to synthesize the necessary amount of vitamin D that they needed. Coastal populations were very interesting because if they had access to fish, a very vitamin D rich food source, then they could in a sense afford to be a bit darker than their hinterland brethren. But one of the things that we have to think about when we talk about the populating of Europe is that the people who went into especially some of the northern areas had certainly well, they were wearing clothes. They weren't naked. They were covered with furs or some, some kind of simply sewn clothes. And so they had less of their skin actually exposed to the sun. So that's something we have to take into account too. When you wear clothes, you have less skin exposed and the skin that is exposed has to do more work in synthesizing vitamin D. The Ice Age was to cut these first Europeans off eliminating any contact with the rest of the world. In isolation, they developed distinctive traits. Their hair color changed, the shape of their noses changed, even their height. Today, people with European ancestors, like me and these French pool players, look pretty different from our distant relatives. But why had it taken our ancestors so long to arrive here? Whatever kind of journey they made, it's clear that they developed a whole new range of life skills along the way. So why did it take my ancestors 10,000 years to get to Europe from the Middle East? And why had they changed so much? The accepted theory was that they made their way around the Mediterranean and up through Turkey. Then, our research threw a wrench in the works. Until relatively recently, we had no reason to doubt that the first Europeans had followed a direct route out of the Middle East. And then, quite by chance, we uncovered evidence that they'd come from somewhere else entirely. Turns out, when they left the Middle East, my European ancestors went on a tough and grueling detour. I'm going to pick up their genetic trail in a faraway land that begins long after these rail tracks have run out. As the sampling of the world's populations mounted, I tackled one of the greatest genetic blind spots of the world. Since childhood, I've been fascinated by characters from along the Silk Road traders and travelers like Marco Polo, and conquerors like Genghis Khan. I traveled to the ex-Soviet republics of Central Asia, little known parts of the world, to sample the blood of their descendants. We're in Bishkek, the capital of the former Soviet Republic of Kyrgyzstan. I first came here in 1996, and you really had the feel that you were coming to a very remote place. You know, some of the villages that we visited in Kyrgyzstan, we were the first foreigners that they'd seen since, you know, 200, 300 years ago, perhaps. When I first came here, this was new ground, untrammeled by any other Western scientist before me. 
For nearly a century, it was closed off behind the Iron Curtain. Even today, it's one of the most remote parts of the world. In this isolated land, I collected the blood of over 2,000 people. That was when we discovered that their blood held a remarkable secret, an ancient marker. I recognized it immediately. Nearly every man in Western Europe was carrying it, from Norway to Spain, Ireland to Austria. So my European ancestors hadn't taken the obvious route from Africa via the Middle East. Instead, they had passed through Central Asia 40,000 years ago. That was why they had taken so long to reach my homeland. But why would they do that? How did my ancient family from the Middle East wind up here, in this wilderness? William Calvin thinks that yet again the weather played a critical role. Worldwide, you're getting droughts, you're getting forest fires, but the next year you're getting a lot of grass and a lot of grazing animals. And that's opportunity for the, the humans that survived the, the crash. And for opportunity, read food. Honing their hunting skills and adapting to the colder temperatures, these African hunters followed the grasslands into modern-day Kazakhstan. The discovery of the Central Asian marker had changed our understanding of the journey made by the first Europeans. But was Europe the only destination for these formidable Central Asian hunters? Did their journey take them anywhere else? We widened our search and were in for an even bigger surprise. The markers seemed to be everywhere we looked, from Europe, through Asia, Russia, North and South America, the list seemed to be endless. We'd uncovered an astounding secret. If Africa was the cradle of mankind, then Central Asia was its nursery. Bizarre, sea of faces. And you can tell so much from a face, or can you? Where are we now? We could be anywhere across the continent of Eurasia, but in fact, we're right at the very heart of it, in Central Asia. China is a few miles in that direction. Afghanistan, a few hundred miles to the south. This is really the crossing point, the central part of the continent of Eurasia. And I've come back for a very special reason. Hidden in the samples of those 2,000 Central Asians was one extraordinary individual. His name is Niazov, and he's directly descended from the man whose DNA, 40,000 years ago, had a tiny spelling mistake, the Central Asian marker. This genetic marker has spread throughout the Northern Hemisphere and been inherited by over a billion people. Branches of Niazov's ancestors went on to people Europe, parts of India, Russia, and America. But Niazov's family has always stayed here. Analyzing his DNA for the first time was an extraordinary moment. In an instant, I knew we'd discovered something very important. Now we're going to meet him. After nearly 2,000 generations, Niazov still lives in Central Asia. I'm excited about meeting him again, now that I fully understand the history he holds in his blood. But with a war raging less than 200 miles away in Afghanistan, making it across the border could be a little dicey. Kazakhstan has locked down its borders because of the situation in Afghanistan. Possible refugees, possible Islamic militants. Everything's a bit touchy right now. 